Othello is a tragedy, but Act 1 is a comedy. It has the classic tale of a father and daughter who disagree over who the daughter should marry, then she decides to run away with the man that she loves, and it ultimately works out. They get to be together. Act 1 uses a classic story archetype of star-crossed lovers, and one that ends in marriage rather than tragedy. This act is a one-act version of the storyline from A Midsummer's Night's Dream. We've seen it before. Desdemona gets to be with Othello, just like Hermia gets to be with Lysander. Obviously, this is going to get real dark real fast, but for now, in Act 1, we get a comedy. And that well-worn, star-crossed lover structure isn't the only archetype at work here. In Act 1 of Othello, a series of stock characters are paraded on stage. We meet the lovesick fool in Rodrigo, or to use the language of today's youth, Rodrigo performs the archetype of a simp or an incel. We meet the overprotective father in Brabantio. We meet Othello, the charismatic guy from out of town. Desdemona, the beautiful, innocent, and sheltered daughter who wants more than this provincial life. And we meet the villain, Iago. All of the characters want to control the story, to bend the action of the play in a direction that will affirm their individuality, and they're trying to do that by attempting to control the narrative of the play. They each want to position themselves as the hero and anybody who stands in their way as the villain. This play, and this act specifically, will be a battle of storytellers. This video is part of a larger series on Othello that will closely analyze each act. If that sounds like it's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing uh, to be notified when future videos are out. And with that out of the way, let's continue to analyze Act 1 of Othello. So Act 1 starts off in the middle of things. Iago and Rodrigo appear in mid-conversation discussing Othello, but they don't name him. In fact, Othello isn't named on stage until the Duke directly addresses him in the third scene of this act. He's only referred to in the opening scenes as the Moor, a term I will return to in a future video, but for now we can simply understand the term to mean that Othello is an outsider in Venice and that he has darker skin than the other characters. That's the first thing that we learn about him. The second thing that we learn about him through Iago is that he loves his own pride and purposes, that he is horribly stuffed with the epithets of war, and that he has overlooked Iago for a promotion. So we, as the audience, are told stories about Othello before we encounter Othello. Others get the chance to characterize him to the audience before he's permitted to tell his own side of the story. And what do we learn? Well, Iago tells us that Othello is arrogant directly, but he also encourages us to bring our own biases with us. In the presumed white and Christian audience of this play, we are positioned to understand Othello as an outsider. Iago uses the associations and biases people in the audience might have against Moors as part of his initial characterization. When he's only referred to by his group identity and not his individual identity, not by his name, the audience is encouraged to turn to stereotypes. So that's how this play starts, Roderigo and Iago dialoguing about how much they dislike Othello. We quickly learn as the audience that Othello has eloped with a senator's daughter without that senator's permission, and Iago encourages Roderigo to play the snitch, wake up the senator, and get everybody angry about this. These two both want to destroy Othello, and finding people with institutional power seems to be a good strategy for them. And why do they want to destroy Othello? Well, Rodrigo is in love with Desdemona, the senator's daughter Othello has secretly married, so that's his reason. And Iago is pissed off because he was overlooked for a promotion. Othello made Michael Cassio his lieutenant, and Iago feels entitled to that position. So he's jealous of Cassio, and he has a bruised ego. This translates into a desire to hurt Othello. Iago is going to be the villain of this story and arguably its protagonist, so it's worth taking a closer look at his opening characterization. After he explains that whole lieutenant business, Rodrigo asks Iago why he continues to work for Othello if he hates him so much. Iago responds that he follows Othello only to serve his term upon him. In other words, he tells us right away that he is only playing a character. He's performing a role. He can say and do one thing, like support and work for Othello, but that's not the real Iago. It's a performance. It's a story. And importantly, it's a story that serves Iago, not Othello. He says that in following Othello, he really follows himself. Throughout this play, we're going to see a lot of characters try to control the narrative around themselves. 
Like there is the way that I want the world to see me. There is the character that I want to be. So I try to play that character out in the world. But then there is the way that the world actually perceives me. I'm only one person participating in my own characterization. What others say when they talk about me and tell my story has an impact on the way that I'm perceived in the world, on the way that my character is perceived. Other people might cast me in a role that I don't particularly want. At its core, this is a play about trying to control one's own story. There are lots of reasons to find the character of Iago fascinating, but his recognition of this fact, his recognition that he is his own storyteller and the urgency with which he controls the narrative around himself, it's entrancing. And it starts here in Act 1, Scene 1. He views the creation of his character as an act of protection. He says, For when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart, in complement extern, tis not long after, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for daws to peck at. I am not what I am. In other words, he tells us straight up, we will not see the real Iago. We will only see the performance of Iago. If his inner humanity ever matches the outward appearance, then he'll be vulnerable with his heart on his sleeve for birds to peck at. And in that final line here, he tells us exactly what he is. I am not what I am. A line that is strikingly similar to a line from Exodus when God tells Moses, I am that I am. In Exodus, Moses has asked God his name, and God's response is simply, I am that I am. This would be immediately recognizable to an early 17th century audience. Iago is telling us his name. I am not what I am. He is the opposite of God. He's the devil. And here he is, appealing to Rodrigo's lust, his pride, his wrath, guiding him to take action, to wake up Desdemona's father and snitch on Othello. So when they both yell up at Brabantio's window and tell him his house has been robbed, which... If we're talking about the way that we tell stories about other people and how that shapes their character, our first characterization of Desdemona tells us that she's property, something that can be stolen from a house. Anyway, Iago tells Brabantio that at this very moment, an old black ram is topping your white ewe. So she's not just property, she's an innocent, pure white sheep as well. Point is, she's definitely not human with her own agency. Similar to Othello, a lot of people will tell us about Desdemona before Desdemona will get to tell us about herself. Iago gets to tell us exactly who he is right away. Desdemona does not have that privilege. Iago leaves the scene as soon as they succeed in making Brabantio angry. He tells us he has to go join Othello because he must continue to play his part as Othello's ensign. Brabantio confirms that Desdemona isn't in her room, and he asks Rodrigo to help him find Othello. They want the state government to interfere and prevent the marriage, and that's the end of scene one. Scene two begins with Iago warning Othello that Brabantio has a lot of power in Venice, and that Othello can expect some trouble. With that, we finally get to hear Othello speak for himself. Let him do his fight. My services which I have done the Signore shall out-tongue his complaints. He isn't scared at all. He confirms his reputation for bravery right away. He tells us that his demerits may speak unbonneted. His full self can be on display and judged, and he's confident that he will be respected anyway. This is, like, essentially the opposite of Iago, who feared having his true self judged. Iago hides himself behind a series of false fronts. He's one character to Rodrigo, another character to Othello. He's a constant performance of multiple selves. Othello, though. Othello says, not I. I must be found. My parts, my title, and my perfect soul shall manifest me rightly. He's not afraid to be seen as he actually is. Before Rorazio can find him, however, Michael Cassio finds him to tell him that the Duke is looking for him. There is news from Cyprus, and the Duke needs his best soldier. So Othello, on his wedding night, is in high demand. The Duke needs him for war, and the Senator wants him to be arrested. Brabantio has very specific accusations to make about Othello. He says, Thou hast enchanted her. Thou hast practiced on her with foul charms. He's accusing Othello of using magic to entrance his daughter. He wants the state to hear his case and insists that Othello be taken to the prison. And Brabantio is a powerful man. When he makes accusations and threats like this, he expects that they're going to be followed. 
but the presence of Othello disrupts that expectation right away. When Brabantio tells two men to lay hold upon him, Othello tells them to hold their hands, and they listen to Othello, not Brabantio. In this scene, Othello is a man talking to children, so confident in his own ability to both fight and talk his way out of this situation that he doesn't show any signs at all of anxiety or nerves. He calmly tells Brabantio that he's on his way to the Duke anyway because he's been called there. So off they go, and so off we go to scene three. And this first part of Act 1, Scene 3 takes us in an entirely different direction. These lines are often cut in performances to save time, but I actually think that they're really important. The Duke here is sifting through reports of a Turkish invasion of Cyprus and preparing for its defense when a sailor enters the scene and says that the Turks are headed for Rhodes, not Cyprus. The Duke listens and weighs this information against what he already knows. Cyprus is more important than Rhodes, and the trust that he has that the Turks will not be foolish in their strategy leads him to figure it out on his own. In this stressful moment when a decision needs to be made quickly, his ability to receive new information and weigh it against what he already knows and then rationally dismiss the new reports provide the audience with an example of how to deal with fake news. He's told that the Turks are headed for Rhodes. He listens tentatively, then analyzes that one piece of information within the larger context of information before saying, he's not for Rhodes. He's quickly proven correct as a second messenger confirms his analysis and, because this is a busy office, Brabantio and Othello enter right away. The Duke notably greets Othello first, since Othello is actually needed in this moment. He must be sent to Cyprus to prepare for the defense. Brabantio is an afterthought. The Duke even says, oh, I didn't see you there. Brabantio's domestic complaints seem trivial in the context of global politics, but he voices them with urgency anyway. It's clear that the story Brabantio has about himself, that he's like a really important guy, is not really vibing with the way that the other characters see him. Brabantio is so upset here that another senator thinks his daughter might be dead. He uses his platform to rant about how Othello used magic on his daughter. He charmed her. He enchanted her. And the state should do something about that. That's his complaint. Again, demonstrating good investigative practices, the Duke turns to the person that these accusations are actually made about and asks him directly. He asks Othello to explain himself. And boy, does he. Othello delivers a speech that is eloquent, humble, and assertive at the same time. His words are poetic even though he says that he's rude of speech. He reminds everybody of his physical strength and his past service to the government that he's standing in front of. His patience and his poetry sit in stark contrast to the bombast of Brabantio. Both Othello and Brabantio are trying to tell a story about Othello, and Othello is clearly winning. He controls his own narrative. He's exactly the opposite of what Iago told us that he was in the first scene. Brabantio repeats his accusations. There's no way that his daughter fell in love with such a scary man unless that man used magic against her. He's crafting a story of a terrifying magical foreigner who has come in and entranced a beautiful woman. So Othello is asked directly, Did you, by indirect and forced courses, subdue and poison this young maid's affections? And in a move that we should take note of now, Othello essentially says, Why don't you ask her? Let her speak of me before her father. We should take note of this, because Othello will very notably not call her to speak for herself later in the play. But for now, all the accused can speak for themselves rather than simply have stories told about them. While we wait for Desdemona to finally enter this play, Othello tells us one more story about her. He tells us how they actually fell in love. He was often invited to her house by Brabantio, who asked him to tell stories of his life. He tells us that he has lived through many adventures, that he was sold into slavery, that he escaped, that he traveled around the world and saw cannibals and people with heads in their chest. It's a good story, but we should also be reminded that the two people who hate Othello the most, Rodrigo and Iago, start this play by accusing him as loving his own pride and purposes, evades them with bombast circumstance, horribly stuffed with the epithets of war. They've warned us that Othello can tell a good story, and his stories aren't always consistent, something that we'll return to in future videos. 
But for now, it's good to recognize that he has taken his position as an outsider, as a foreigner, and reframed it as an exciting and interesting thing rather than a scary thing. Barantio and Iago want us to see the differences that Othello inhabits as something to be afraid of, but he's reframed that story of his difference to, well, make himself look like really cool and interesting. But let's return to that speech before Desdemona enters. Othello says something really interesting in it. He says that after he told his story to Desdemona, she wished she had had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. And that's ambiguously phrased in a really interesting way. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. Does this mean that she wishes she were a man so she could have had such adventures? Or does it simply mean that she wishes heaven had made her a husband with such adventures? We don't know. She hasn't been able to speak for herself yet, so we don't actually know what kind of person she is. He continued to say that she thanked me and bade me if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story, and that would woo her. Upon this hint I spake, she loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. So she loves him for his stories, and he loves her because she likes his stories. That's how it happened. That's the meat cute Othello has told his story so well that the Duke says that it would have won his daughter as well. Lots of daughters being treated as prizes here so far. Anyway, Desdemona finally enters and is allowed to speak for herself, and she uses this opportunity to speak of a double duty. How she is torn between her duty to her father and the duty to her husband. In short, she confirms her love for Othello, and there's really nothing that Brabantio can do about it. Unfortunately for the new couple, Othello is being asked to leave for Cyprus, so Desdemona will have to live somewhere, and it doesn't really seem like her father's house is going to be an option. So the Duke asks her where she would like to go, and she wants to go to Cyprus, to war. She says that she saw Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honors and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind a month of peace, and he go to the war, the rights for why I love him are bereft me, and I a heavy interim shall support. By his dear absence, let me go with him. So maybe she does wish that she was made a man so that she could have adventures? Maybe she got both the husband and the wish to be a warrior by herself? But let's take a look at another thing that she says here. She says that she saw Othello's visage in his mind. She needs to be around him in his stories. That's how she sees his mind. That's why she married him. So she must go to Cyprus with him. Iago will take her there, though Othello must leave immediately. Before he does, however, Brabantio gives him one final warning. Look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see. She hath deceived her father, and may thee. Othello, though, is unshakable. Brabantio is a silly guy, and Othello cannot be shaken. Or so we think. After this, everybody else exits, but Iago and Rodrigo, who began this act, will end it for us. Their attempt to destroy Othello totally failed. This first act was a classic comedy. It's a classic tale of star-crossed lovers, but with a happy ending. It was Pyramus and Thisbe, Troilus and Cressida, Romeo and Juliet, two lovers who have overcome obstacles um, that were represented here by Iago and Brabantio and Rodrigo, but unlike those other couples, Othello and Desdemona are successful. They win. They get to be together. It's a comedy, but in the final moments of this act, we learn that this was only practice for Iago. He tells Rodrigo to liquidate his assets and go to Cyprus for another try. And when Rodrigo exits, the audience is left alone with Iago. This will happen a number of times in this play. He's going to speak with us directly, and consequently, we as the audience will have a closer relationship with Iago than any other character in the play. We are made complicit in all of his mischief because he confides in us. He tells us that he hates the more, but he tells us a different reason than he told Rodrigo earlier. The story he told Rodrigo is that he's angry about a missed promotion. He tells us that he hates the more because it's thought abroad that betwixt his sheets Othello hath done his office, or in less pretty words, he thinks Othello slept with his wife. He actually admits to us that there's no proof that this is true, but that doesn't matter. He's going to act like it's true anyway. Samuel Taylor Coleridge described this as the motive hunting of motiveless malignity. Iago tells us he's going to abuse Othello's ear by telling him stories of Desdemona's infidelity. Iago may have failed to create his tragedy in Act 1, but he promises us that hell and night must bring his monstrous birth to the world's light. And that'll take us to Act 2. 
Please subscribe to be notified when that video is published and for future seasons. Thank you for watching.